Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Shenango Forward Phase 3 reopening webinar. It's exciting to see so many people joining us today, and it's very exciting to be doing this webinar and having a lot of the information that we didn't have available when we did Phase 2. Uh, we have a lot to get through today, and we have some great speakers, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick reminder, please keep your microphone on mute if you are not one of our panelists. Um, if you have any questions, you can use the group Zoom chat. Uh, myself and the staff will be monitoring that and we'll get to your questions as we can throughout the presentation. And we're gonna hope to have some time at the end. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, also, as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded and we'll be sharing it through our YouTube channel and through our social media sites. In addition, um, everybody who's registered for this will get an email with a PDF of all of the slides, as well as a link to our YouTube page. I'd like to thank our very special guests. Today we have Isaiah Sutton. He is the Director of Environmental Health with Shenango County. We also have Matt Beckwith, Director of Emergency Management Services in Shenango County Bureau of Fire. They'll be joining us for parts of our presentation today. And for those who do not know me, my name is Carrie Green. I'm the President and CEO here at Commerce Shenango. Two of our special business owner guests from Chenango County this, uh, this week's presentation, we have Anna Banks. She is owner of My Home Gym located in Bainbridge. We also have David Schull. He owns the stadium in, in Oxford and Nina's restaurant here in Norwich. Um, they'll be joining us in a little bit to talk with you more about their business and how they've been coping with COVID-19. A real quick overview of what the reopening guidelines look like. I know we've gone through this every time, so I won't spend a lot of time. There are seven metrics to decide if your uh, region can open. We've met all of those metrics here in the southern tier. The southern tier has been very strong throughout all of this, so that's thanks to all of you for doing what you can um, to keep those numbers strong and following safe uh, health practices. Um, this data is monitored by the regional control room, and then the governor has a separate team of experts that take a deeper dive into that data to determine if we can go into our next phase. And very excited to share that as of today's press conference with Governor Cuomo, he announced that we are ready to move into phase three. That begins tomorrow, Friday, June 12th. So anybody who's part of the phase three will be able to reopen tomorrow. Um, that's very exciting for people. We were a little unclear if it was going to be tomorrow, Saturday, Monday. We were telling our businesses to be ready, get prepared. Um, and a little bit, we'll talk about what businesses have to do to actually open in phase three. For those who are taking part of the payroll protection program, I wanted to share with you that Congressman Brindisi's office, uh, Congressman Brindisi, I should say, was a fierce advocate for us in helping with this flexibility act. There were some changes that were made to the PPP program. Um, I just want to highlight a few of them for you that will make it much easier for our businesses for, who have this. Um, there was some forgiveness for expenses beyond the eight-week covered period that were part of this Flexibility Act. The restrictions were loosened regarding the non-payroll expenses. Um, there are some restrictions that were eliminated that limited the term of the loan for two years. Um, another big part, the last check mark on this was providing a rehiring safe harbor for businesses that were unable to rehire due to the enhanced unemployment insurance. Um, as we know here at Commerce Shenango and as our friend the congressman knows, uh, some businesses have had difficulty bringing employees back, um, especially those employees that were making minimum wage or um, a, you know, a lower wage because of uh, unemployment, having that extra $600 as part of their um, unemployment benefits. It's made it a little difficult and so businesses who got the PPP program were expressing concern that while they were trying to bring their, bring their employees back, they weren't able to and there was a threshold for um, how many employees you had to bring back. Um, I believe on the line, we actually have Faith Babra from Congressman Brindisi's office. Faith, are you still here with us? I am. Thanks. Anything you'd like to add and I just, you know, I'd like to say thank you to you. Thank you to the Congressman. Um, we're all very excited. We, we learned about the two awards that he received yesterday. I don't want to steal your thunder, so if you're going to talk about that, I won't. <laughs> but thank you for everything that you do. And is there anything about this or anything from the congressman you'd like to share? Um, just that, you know, we really appreciate um, everybody's input. I think that was really important. We had a lot of people contact us from Shenango County and, um, you know, especially about this Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act 
and uh, and the congressman, uh, he fought really hard for it. So I'm so excited, you know, to be able to do something that actually impacts our community. So much of what we do on the federal level, you find it a hard way to, to trickle down, but, but this is fantastic. So we're excited and um, yes, uh, the congressman has received two awards from the um, U.S. Chamber this week, and we found out about those. And you know, for, for just working really well with businesses and and being really popular, um, you know, nonpartisan, bipartisan position. So we're we're excited about all that. And of course, you guys know um, if you have any questions about the Paycheck Prevention or Pray Tech Protection Program, feel free to call me or call the office and we'll get you any information that you need. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faith. Um, Faith is uh, our local agent here. She spends a lot of time in Chenango County. Um, we love her, so thank you for everything that you do and thanks again to the congressman. Uh, moving on, uh, today's webinar is about phase three. So as I'm sure most of you know, phase three includes restaurant and food services and also personal care. And we're going to dive into what that means. Um, we have Isaiah Sutton um, is on with us today and I'm gonna have him go through with you um, what falls under personal care, food service, and he has some information to share with you specific to some of that food service, indoor guidance, um, you know, the SLA requirements. So uh, Isaiah, do you wanna take, pick it up from here? Sure. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Um, so this gets right into my wheelhouse. I like talk, telling restaurants uh, what the rules are. Kind of that's what we're good at at environmental health. So uh, with personal care, that's going to include tattoo, piercing facilities, appearance enhancement pr practitioners. I don't know what that one means, but uh, massage therapy, spas, cosmetology, nail services, specialty service and UV and non-UV tanning or waxing. Um, so this really does open up kind of a lot of stuff we might have thought would have been originally opened up with hair salons, um, but can now go ahead and get started. All those folks should uh, file uh, an attestation with the state that they've read the applicable guidance for their industry, as well as complete a safety plan template to keep on hand. Um, obviously, we're still asking everyone to follow those guidances and do the best that they can to protect themselves, their employees, and all of their customers. Okay, food service. So now we're kind of back in. Last week, we talked a bit about outdoor dining, um, which was good. I know I ate a couple dinners on the sidewalk this week, uh, but I'm going to be excited in, this, in the coming week to be able to actually get into a nice air-conditioned restaurant and have a... Uh, a couple dinners. So right now we're kind of looking at uh, indoor seating as well as outdoor seating uh, expansion. I know a lot of folks have gone ahead and expanded their outdoor seating options. So I think that's great and we'll be able to continue to do that. Uh, as we look at the specific guidance, kind of the high points um, carries outlined here, no more than 50% occupancy, right? There's a little pink sign in the restaurant that says you can have this many people in each room. Uh, you can't be over 50% of that as in so far as that you can keep everyone six feet apart. Um, if you, your 50% number is 25, but you can only get 15 people in there safely, then your number is 15, right? Wh however you can get folks six feet apart. Um, this does not include people at the same table. You can have party sizes up to 10, uh, no more than 10. If you're, uh, you have a bar or a counter, and two people coming together, they can sit next to each other at the counter. The next party has to be six feet away. We're gonna leave that kind of up to restaurants on how they police some of that. You know, I don't think you're gonna, you know, some folks have talked about taking away stools, taking away chairs and tables, uh, marking them off, whatever works to keep folks separated. As we look down further through the guidance, um, they want you to kind of reimagine how your business works. If you can have multiple uh, entrances and exits, right? So people come in one door and out the other. If your restaurant can accommodate that, that's great. Um, if you can use all the proper signage for six foot distancing as well as mask use, customers should wear a mask whenever they're not sitting at their table. They get up to use the restroom, they get up to order a drink, um, 
they go outside to have a smoke, whatever they're doing, uh, they need to wear a mask in, tran in transit through the restaurant. Uh, all staff also has to wear a mask. Um, and any of the restaurateurs on here, that's a little diversion from our previous guidance. Up until now, we've been telling folks, if your back of the house kitchen staff is six feet apart, that they didn't have to. Uh, the guidance released this week says all kitchen staff must wear masks at all times. Um, I would advocate to try to pick up some of these, talk to Matt Beckwith if you haven't already. These masks are much uh, easier to breathe through than some of the cloth masks that are out there. And I know as a former cook, uh, it's gonna be hot in there and tough to breathe through the masks, but we are asking that all kitchen staff uh, use masks. I see a question there that all bartenders have to wear masks. That's yeah, that's definitely yes. Because they're uh, face to face with customers all the time. So we talked about masks. Um, all, a lot of the hygiene, hand hygiene stuff is stuff that restaurants should be doing already, right? We already expected the restaurateurs were washing their hands every uh, time they did anything, touched their face, changed their gloves, went outside. We still expect that. Um, and maybe even a little more and add a disinfection step with some hand sanitizer as appropriate. All food services must make hand wash and or sanitizing available to customers. So food trucks or outdoor seating areas should have hand sanitizer available. Um, otherwise, make sure your hand wash facilities inside are uh, well provisioned. I'm happy to answer any specific questions as we go forward if any restaurants are on the call and have uh, specific questions about their plan, my staff is uh, kind of briefed and ready to answer those uh, where we can. So the New York State Liquor Authority, I, anybody who's got a liquor license probably already has been contacted by them. Uh, they must, uh, they've got their own requirements. I know anybody did outdoor seating, you had to send them in a drawing of what that looked like. That's still uh, the case. Their separation and mask wearing and social distancing rules mimic what the governor's office put out this week. So all those should be the same. Uh, as far as the liquor authority, where you can drink alcohol and serve alcohol, uh, keep an eye on that. Right now they're still operating under the emergency provisions, which allow for the delivery and takeout of alcoholic beverages. I don't know how long that provision will last and stay open. I suspect that sometime in the coming months, you'll see them start to reel some of that back. Um, and I, that's the liquor. If you have specific questions about the liquor authority stuff, uh, I've been to their website. They've got some pretty good Q and A documents on there. Uh, so that's sla.ny.gov. Uh, make sure you go and check that out. Um, and restaurants still, even if you've phased, you still have to redo a safety plan for this phase. So if you're, Previous safety plan only included outdoor seating. We need you to fill another, or we want you to fill another one out for your indoor seating. Uh, you know, how are you gonna do this portion of the business? Um, I see we had a quote, oh, Carrie covered the question. Yes, all kitchen staff are required to wear masks. Um, this is something that I think we'll see change. I don't know. We've put a, a question into Albany about this request. So far, we don't see food handlers as being a source of transmission or haven't seen it through this outbreak. Um, so I imagine the restaurant associations will advocate for this change. All right. So I says, I'm trying to tag team you with, while you're talking and answer questions. But, <laughs> um, since Isaiah, you're so knowledgeable about what's happening with the restaurants and all of this, I'm sure you've been, you've been in it day in and day out. Um, does anybody else have a question for Isaiah specifically about the restaurant industry? Um, if you do, please use the chat window and Isaiah's gonna be on throughout the call. So if something else happens or you have another question, but um, Isaiah, somebody asked about a horseshoe league. Is this okay to restart? The horseshoe league is gonna, is gonna fall under outdoor rec. Um, we had another question about that. I haven't had a chance to go through those guidance just yet. Um, and I hope to do that. I've got staff on it now, actually. And hopefully we'll have a better answer tomorrow. So I would say, give me a call tomorrow afternoon. And I should have gone through all of that guidance by then. Um, there's a question here about live entertainment. Um, I actually have an answer on that, Isaiah. I haven't had a chance to email you yet since the control room <laughs> call today. Do you want to handle this or do you want me to? No, no. Okay. 
so yeah, we I every day I, I'm on the control room call um, and I update Isaiah and Marcus and Matt and I just haven't <laughs> had the chance today. So this came up today um, about live entertainment and so yes, um, you are allowed to have live entertainment. Um, you still need to make sure that there's enough space between where the live entertainment is and um, where the people are. If it's indoor, you have to make sure you're still following your 50% capacity. So um, that that you know, if it's a large band, you need to take that into account. Um, but yes, live bands are allowed as long as you're taking appropriate distancing measures. Um, uh, someone asked, do we have to submit our safety plan template to the state or just have it available for inspection? Isaiah, you want to take that? Yeah, you just need to have your plan completed and on hand. Um, if and when we get a complaint, we will then give you a call. We'll review the complaint itself as well as your plan. At that time, we may give some recommendations about how the plan could be improved if there's any shortcomings. Um, but no, we don't, we don't need to review it um, until there's an issue. Um, you know, some continued questions about the mask, you know, I'll just re restate that, hey. you know, this is, um, this is a law. It is something that, oh, Omar, are you on? Yeah. Hey, Carrie, how Hi. are you? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Um, I just wanted, I heard of the question about the horseshoes. So yeah. I just wanted to just, um, just chime in here. Uh, that is an allowed use. Um, for all of you that are, want to know sort of where to find the guidance for the outdoor recreational activities, you can go on the ESD website uh, for the ESD guidance. Um, and at the bottom, I believe it's number 13, um, you'll see all of the sort of extended uh, outdoor recreation, uh, outdoor recreational activities that we have, uh, they have expanded, I think as of last, just a few days ago. So, so in horseshoes are on that, just so you know. And it's on the ESD site right now? Yes. Great, great, thank you. The idea this is helpful for all of us. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a question about um, presenter of live music. So, um, so this is not, when we talked about live music earlier, um, I was answering that in terms of like a restaurant or a bar. This does not mean that entertainment facilities can reopen. This is, um, this is strictly for bars and restaurants who have live entertainment. So those of you who have something that falls under phase four in terms of arts and entertainment, um, you are still not able to open. Um, there's still a lot of restrictions regarding groups of people that are together. Um, so it's, it's not, it's, there, these, these laws and, and guidelines are not interchangeable. Um, I know there's been a lot of comments about, well, if we can have a graduation with 150 people, why can't we have an event? These are things that were done specifically to address certain concerns and trying to you know, move forward in the best way possible. But when you're looking at the restrictions and the guidelines, they're not interchangeable with each other. I hope that's helpful. Um, so the, um, I have a couple private questions I'll, I'll get to later, but, oh, sorry, um, the outdoor recreation requirements, uh, as Omar said, if you go to the ESD website, there's a section under outdoor rec, but, um, I could also drop them in an email to somebody, so, um, let me know if that's something that you need. Um, somebody asked, there's a question about having to file with the state, um, and then go online to agree. So I'll actually, uh, we're going to go through the the certification process here in just a minute. Um, so I guess, uh, Isaiah, do you want to say anything else before we move forward and we'll, we'll try to address some more questions in a bit? No, I'll just reiterate that if any uh, restaurants have specific questions to give a call to our office uh, and we will work through them kind of on a one-by-one -one basis. Great. Thank you so much, Isaiah. Don't go anywhere in case I think you have some more sections <laughs> Not a problem. So no disappearing. <laughs> All right, so just a couple uh, quick new developments that happened in the last week or two in case you have not heard. Um, some other areas that had some approvals and some specific guidelines on the forwardny.gov page. Um, graduations, garage and yard sales are able to, uh, to occur. Uh, worship services are now open, day camps and childcare, racing venues, dentistry, and additional um, outdoor rec. Um, that area has been expanded. Um, so we'll make sure that, uh, you know, the health department, we all have that information. So if you have any questions about any of these specific um, areas, we'll, we'll um, get to this um, in a little bit. But I just wanted to share with you that all of, most of this can be found on the forward.ny.gov page and the outdoor rec um, and information can be found on the ESD page. So we have uh, some great speakers joining us today and I'm very excited to hear them. So 
um, you know, this, this whole take a chance, make a change. Um, you know, businesses really had a choice when everything happened with COVID-19 when the pandemic hit. They could have just sat back and not done anything and waited to see what happened, or they could have been innovative. And during our phase two conversation, we talked with a couple of businesses that were doing what they needed to do to keep their business open and thriving. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, present to you David Schull. He is the owner of the Stadium Sports Bar and Grill in Oxford and Nina's Pizzeria and Restaurant in Norwich. Um, I, you know, I reached out to them to see if they were willing to join us today because you know, they've been really great with social media, with outreach. They were doing curbside pickup, um, you know, taco platters, margaritas to go, right? You know, love some margarita. <laughs> um, and Nina's too. They, you know, both of them are great with social media, with their marketing, with their advertising. Um, and I really thought it'd be great to hear from them as a business owner throughout you know, the last few months, what, how they decided to make the changes that they made, what they're looking at for the future. And now with the, with the phase three pending tomorrow, we could, we could hear a little bit from them. So David, are you, are you on and ready to go? Yes. All thank right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yes, thank and you. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Well, uh, as Carrie said, uh, we did remain open through uh, this entire pandemic, we kind of had two ends of the spectrum when you look at the stadium, sports bar, and Nina's. Um, Nina's actually really kind of maintained a pretty solid business with takeout. Uh, we added delivery. Uh, we were able to retain some of our servers um, as delivery drivers, so we were able to retain some of our employees that way. Um, that's something that we typically did not do to residential um, housing. We added that. We typically only did businesses, but by adding that, it did help us um, really survive through the last few months. Uh, we added the curbside, which many people took advantage of. Um, all those things are probably things that we're going to continue even after everything is is semi back to normal. Um, so Nina's was, we did a lot for, we tried to do a lot for the community. Um, and I think, you know, that helped us as well. We got a lot of uh, people that came in and really wanted to support the community. Um, they would, we would get donations on a daily basis and we always uh, kind of pass that forward to uh, frontline workers, um, hospital, police officers, fire department, um, even some sometimes over at the health department. Um, so I think that really kind of kind of helped us as well. Um, we saw that people really uh, appreciated that. So uh, we were able to, to do that throughout the time that everything was kind of shut down. Uh, moving forward with Nina's, um, obviously we're excited to be able to open the restaurant back up, uh, even at the 50% capacity. Uh, we never really maintained our normal business level, but we were able to um, survive. We were qualified for the PPP loan um, at both locations. We unfortunately, we got those right out of the gate. Um, so we are in week eight, unfortunately. So we followed the guidelines to a T and we will not be able to take advantage of these new changes that are that are being implemented as we speak. So um, it's unfortunate, uh, especially I know you said earlier, it's, it was tough to bring some of the employees back. Uh, we definitely are running into that issue. Um, most that are pretty tenured uh, obviously wanted to, wanted to come back. So we got lucky with that. But a lot of, a lot of our PPP was spent on uh, cleaning, um, a lot of different tasks throughout the restaurant because the business was not at a level that really supported um, having, you know, multiple employees back in the building. I wish the guidelines were a little bit better set up uh, out of the gate, but it is what it is. That's what we got stuck with. So um, the people that are able to now move forward and open their business and, and begin that, that, PPP loan as they start, I think will benefit from it greatly. Uh, we, we definitely benefited from it, but I think the new guidelines are definitely uh, a better option for these business owners. I think they'll see 
being able to utilize some of that money for uh, everyday bills and, um, and stretch that out over a little bit further time, I think is going to be going to be a, a big benefit for them. So moving forward, we're excited for to get people back into the restaurant. Um, we also did some family specials that seemed to be very popular. We knew that families were were in the household um, day and night. So we offered a, a daily family special, which fed up to anywhere between four and six people. Uh, we offered that at a, a very uh, discounted price. Um, came with you know a salad, a full meal with pasta and bread and everything. Uh, we got a lot of response from that. That was uh, helped us out a lot. We've kind of tapered back from that. We've seen that kind of drop off as things have started to open. Uh, moving forward, we're just excited to have people back. Now on the other end of the spectrum, the stadium did not do as well. Um, we, could, we really struggled through up until actually last Thursday when we got the word of being able to open outdoors. Um, it was like our customers just came out of the woodworks. Uh, we have now been able to follow the guidelines, <clears throat> excuse me, and we expanded um, thanks to um, Mr. Brightman and, and his crew with Rentals to Go. They set up an outdoor fenced area with a uh, tent and we were able to follow all the guidelines and we were able to to get many more seats out there as early as Monday we were able to open that up so and since since last Thursday we've seen a huge increase in in our business so we were kind of at that stage where we were going to have to make some decisions that we weren't looking forward to um, the delivery did okay but it was it's not really set up for that type of food. I mean, we, we certainly have deliveries on a daily basis, but hamburgers and even our wings, which are a breaded wing, just they don't travel as well as uh, normal Italian restaurants with pizza and, and different wings and things like that. It's, it's a little bit tougher on the food to travel, you know, a distance with that in a container. So, um, it was it was tough. I had some some great employees that stuck with me. I'm I'm in the same boat with trying to get some of my uh, people to come back, and I, I I get it. But it is a struggle to to bring people back to work. Um, but now that we are seeing a, being able to bring them inside as well, I think we'll see um, that people are gonna have to make some decisions on whether they want to ride out. Uh, you know, the unemployment for another month or really start to come back to work. So um, I guess that's about it. Moving forward, we are going to continue with the outdoor dining as long as they, I heard possibly into July 12th or something like that, that they may extend uh, the regulations on allowing a little bit further, you know, whatever property you, you own, you're allowed to kind of make those provisions. Um, but we'll follow those guidelines as long as we can. I, I think having those extra seats and now the 50% inside. Uh, my wife and I were just there last night. We did a little remodeling in there as, as we were closed. Got some, you know, everything cleaned up and, and all our tables set up last night. So we're looking forward to moving forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. I, I know it. You know, handling a couple different businesses, you had two, you know, like you said, two different spectrums, two different types of businesses that you were trying to do both, you know, the pickup, the curbside service, um, now adjusting for indoor dining, dealing with staffing, um, you know, two wonderful businesses in Chenango County. So thank you so much for, you know, being a part of the community and, and sticking it out and doing what you could to, you know, to remain open. So I know we frequently get takeout from both places so for, on a personal note, Commerce Chenango appreciates you. So. Um, we're going to have Dave on the call uh, through the rest of the call. So if you have any, you know, specific questions for him about what he did or how he did it, um, you know, I definitely would uh, say check out both of their um, social media pages. They're very well done, very active, very current. We never have to guess what specials are. <laughs> um, so they do, you know, as far as uh, online marketing goes, I feel like they do a great job there too. So. Well, thank you for having me. Yep. Thank you.
Thanks, Dave. Um, so next, um, oh, it worked. <laughs> I wasn't sure if the mo movement on this would work. Um, so there are a lot of businesses, you know, so like Dave, he was able to still operate his businesses somewhat. Um, but there are a lot of businesses in Shango County that are still waiting. I know we've had some discussions about, um, you know, discussion right now about bowling alleys. No, bowling alleys are not part of this. That's, you know, that's phase four. Um, or unless they make a special change, which, they, you know, they've done. But right now, um, there are certain app, you know, venues that are not open, entertainment facilities, arts, museums. You know, there's still a lot that we're waiting on. You know, we're still waiting on guidance for um, for little league groups and you know there's a lot of people who are still not open there's a lot that are open so I'm very thankful very happy I appreciate you know the forward momentum here but there's a lot of businesses that are still waiting but they're also not all just sitting on their hands waiting for the next thing and I wanted to bring a special guest today Anna Banks from my home gym Anna are you set up yes Okay, so my home gym, um, besides being my gym, is <laughs> um, Mike and Anna Banks own this. This, this gym is located in Bainbridge, um, and they have just done an amazing job of staying active and relevant with their members. You know, gyms are not open. Fitness centers are not open right now. We're waiting on an executive order to reopen those. Um, but, you know, Mike and Anna have been just as busy as when they have their gym open. So I'm not going to steal all your thunder, Anna. I'm going to go ahead and okay. let you do it. Thanks. All right, thank you so much for having us. Um, yes, like Carrie said, um, we have been closed since March 16th and we have been waiting every single day to find out when we were gonna reopen. Um, I would be lying to say that I don't look like that little boy in the first screen that we saw, just waiting patiently, but starting to get impatient, but we've been super busy while we've been closed. So when we closed, we started evaluating our priorities just like every business owner did. And the only way that we were gonna to continue to thrive and survive, quite frankly, were our members and our community. That's who makes My Home Gym what it is. My Home Gym is a very inclusive facility. We have everyone from your super athletic to 90-year-old women. Um, so these are some of the things that we did to stay relevant and to stay active and to keep our members engaged. One of the first things that we did, as well as many other fitness facilities, is we immediately transitioned our in-person classes to virtual. We were able to, live to deliver 17 spin bikes to 17 of our members who we were still continuing to pay us on a monthly basis. And we've been still holding our spin classes virtually um, twice a week. We have been doing boot camp and pile live. The nice thing about that is we did not make those exclusive to our members. We've been doing them live on our Facebook, so anyone can take advantage of them. And a lot of people have been reaching out to us saying that they've really enjoyed that, you know, physical therapy throughout this entire pandemic. A couple other things we did were we allowed some members to borrow equipment, dumbbells, exercise band, BOSU balls to help keep their physical routine going while we were closed. Another really great thing that we did is we, my mother-in-law cleans for us and we kind of deployed her to call our elderly members regularly. They use the gym not only to stay fit and flexible, but it's also their socializing and we were really concerned about them. So we had her reaching out to them regularly, checking in, saying hello, make sure everyone is doing okay. We also sent thank you cards to our members that continued to support us. Of course, we had a lot of people that couldn't continue to support us or decided that they wouldn't continue to support us during this pandemic, but many members did. And we wanted to let them know how much we appreciated them. And the thank you card goes so far. So this is just a little picture of the thank you card that we sent to our members. And it really is true. We are so humbled and grateful for all of the members that continued to support us during this difficult time. Um, we would not be where we were if it wasn't for them. We're always super engaged on social media. It's really our main way of communicating with people, but we really engaged more right from the get-go. Um, like I said, we closed on March 19th. If you look at this um, little screenshot on March 19th, we did our first Facebook promotion. We 
really made sure that our social media campaigns throughout this time were focused on supporting other local businesses that were also suffering during this time, but also supporting essential workers. So on the first day, we went and we purchased two beautiful bouquets of flowers, one from Sydney Flowers and Gifts and one from Nana's Keepsake, and we delivered them to two of our members. They loved it. Um, we also did a couple social media campaigns with B&W Wine and Liquor on National Nurses Day. We were able to give out, I think it was 30 bottles of wine we ended up giving out to nurses who liked and shared this social media post. We partnered up with East Main Lanes in Sydney and we gave um, two free games and a shoe rental to grocery store employees. And I believe we ended up doing 20 of those. Um, and then Caitlin from Quick Photography we were seeing so many brides and grooms having to cancel their wedding. So it was our wedding anniversary on April 6th. So we said, you know what, like, let's kind of play off of that. And so when life gives you lemons, ask for beer and wine, said no bride ever. We were able to gift or give away um, a re-save the date photo shoot to a couple whose wedding had been canceled during um, the whole COVID thing. So it was, it was really great and um, our members really loved it and so did the community. Then we decided to partner up with Four Towns Strong or Four Towns Forward. Um, Four Towns Forward is a collaboration between Sydney, Afton, Bainbridge, and Unadilla. And we decided we were going to do a virtual 5K. So in three weeks, we raised just over $17,000. That $17,000, 100% of the profits were given back to businesses in those four towns. We bought over 220 gift cards, and we were also able to purchase advertising through WCDO for businesses that weren't in the retail sector that we couldn't buy gift cards for more service-oriented um, businesses in our area. Um, we did this with no major corporate sponsors. SFCU and NBT Bank um, graciously donated $300 each to us, but we didn't consider that to be a major corporate sponsor. All of this money came from community members you know, $30, $50 at a time. So it was a huge undertaking. And like I said, we did it in three weeks. We had a total of 399 participants from 15 different states. The alumni love this. It was an opportunity for them to give back to the towns that they grew up in and they showed up strong. Um, we had two senators and I just have to correct that. We had one senator and one congressman um, sign up for the race. So that was really exciting. We were really excited to have um, Antonio Delgado and James Seward support in this event. We had 17 dogs register and 23 kids. Um, we helped over 100 businesses between gift cards and advertising. It's probably closer to 150. And then we were able to make some nice donations to some local organizations. We donated $255 to DVHS. Um, the Delaware Valley Humane Society, and we donated $5 for every dog or cat or animal that registered. Um, and then we also made a little side donation as well. $500 to the Bainbridge Community Center, $100 to Afton Community Theater, the Unadilla Food Pantry, the Sydney Memorial Library. And then we are also to get, able to give $500 to four graduating seniors in Sydney, Afton, Bainbridge, and Unitigo School Districts. So I just included some of the pictures. Um, again, we had people from all over. It was super well received and it really did amazing things for our business. And all it cost us was time and a lot of feel good moments. This is really amazing, Anna. Uh, thank you for sharing not only what you've been doing to stay active with your members, but what you did for the community. I mean, I, I participated, I did the, the Wipeout COVID. Uh, I walked it with my friends, but it was, it was so much fun and what an amazing uh, feat for you to, to pull off the, the amount of time I know you spent on this was was a lot. So thank you to you and I know Terry Shunk helped you quite a bit with this. Yeah. Um, so thank you to everybody. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so before we uh, move on to the next section, there was, um, there was a question and Isaiah, you might be able to answer this about uh, for restaurants if buffets are allowed. And if buffets are allowed, what are the restrictions? you know? The short answer is that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> the state's guidance, you know, I just, after Dave posted his question, I just kind of went back through it. It doesn't clearly cover buffets, as best I can tell. 
So I think uh, we're going to have to hold on that. Uh, I know my team is Dave, uh, my uh, Dave Gorman, an inspector in my office, asked the same question privately while we were speaking. And we, so we don't have good guidance there yet. Um, uh, I know Dave Shrill, you asked a question. If you want to give me a call in the morning, uh, hopefully we'll get on that one first thing. And uh, because the guidance doesn't say it, we'll help you work through some best practices. Um, it doesn't seem to explicitly uh, ban the use of or bar the use of buffets. So I think we'll just have to reimagine how we're going to use them. Obviously, conceptually, how you're going to time people going up and how are you going to, how are we going to protect the food in use? So we can talk about that a little bit offline um, as I think you and one other facility had very similar questions. And Isaiah, I can shoot that question over to the control room group as well. Okay. Um, to see, and I know Omar is on the line. I don't know, Omar. I, I do remember reading the, um, the, the church, um, the, the worship, um, and in there, it specifically says you can't have um, a buffet <laughs> for church services. So, but I did not, you're right, I did not remember seeing it in the restaurant guidance. So we'll try to find out um, and get back to people. Thank you. Um, so you're getting ready to open your business. I know there's some questions about this. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, we did do a video um, that goes over the whole process, but really quickly, um, if you are phase one, two, and now phase three, you need to go through a self-certification process. Now, I haven't checked again this afternoon. Usually, the self-certification portal is not open for the phase until the phase is officially open, which is until tomorrow. So, you can go in and view the summary guidelines, you can read the guidelines, the detailed guidelines, and you can do the safety plan template, but you might have to go back in tomorrow to actually affirm online. Um, so uh, what, you, what you do is you go to forwardny.gov. It's very easy to find. There's a phase one, phase two, phase three link. There's a statewide guidance link. It's very easy to find. Um, so if you are a personal care service, you click on phase three, you scroll down to personal care, and there's three blue boxes that look just like this. View summary guidelines, read and affirm the guidelines, print business safety plan template. When you read and affirm your detailed guidelines, it's a PDF, depending on which industry you are, it could be eight pages, it could be 15. It goes into very explicit detail about the summary. At the end of that, it says click here to affirm that you've read these guidelines. When you click that, it takes you to a secondary portal. It's a very easy to fill out um, online form, and that's where you submit your, um, your business information. Make sure you fill out all the, all the links, all the, all the sections. Some people are skipping boxes. It makes it difficult to track. Um, every day we get a copy of every business that's affirmed and it's shared with our um, Shenango County Health Department. Um, we, uh, as I said uh, last week, we were getting a lot of questions about how to reaffirm. So I went ahead and I recorded a quick 10, 11 minute video. I walked you through what the process was when I affirmed our essential business. Um, it's the same no matter what industry you're in. You have to go to your own section, but the steps are all the same. So if you go to our YouTube page, look for our pin wheels. Um, there's a video on there. We also shared it through our social media pages and, you know, myself or anyone at Public Health would be happy to guide you through this process. Um, this is a topic that comes up. I know there are some questions here. We, we've covered this before in previous uh, presentations. So I don't think we're going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but um, Isaiah, do you want to talk just briefly about you know, how this is enforced, how it's regulated, what the role of public health is? Shortly, uh, the short answer is we would like to be a consultant on this, but the way we're going to do enforcement is through the complaint system. Am I the only one who's getting uh, some conversation in the background there? All right, sorry. Um, so we're going to do, we're going to ask everyone to comply with the directives that were set forth, um, self-certify, as Carrie just said. Um, anyone who's concerned that a business um, is not operating correctly, can file a complaint through the New York on pause complaint system uh, through the phone number shown on the screen there or can call our office directly. Uh, we respond and follow up to every complaint and we you know, kind of investigate that complaint for validity, uh, completeness, you know, some, and then we take the appropriate action. 90% of the complaints we've received so far have been resolved with a simple phone call. You know, we call, and explain why the action was right, or in some, some cases the action was correct, but other cases where the action was incorrect, uh, we were able to work with the operator 
find a solution pretty quickly. Um, and that's really the extent that we'd like to go with enforcement. As Mark has said in the past, we have other enforcement tools in our toolbox. Uh, if we don't have to open that, that'd be great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and there's a link if you want to go ahead and if there's a complaint that you want to make, there's a phone number. And, you know, I know Marcus and Isaiah, you know, public health feels this way that, um, you know, they're looking to be a partner with people. You know, they're not looking to come in and find you. They don't want to shut you down. They just, you know, they want people to do the right thing, follow the safety guidelines the best that they can. Uh, make sure that your, your staff and your, your customers are all doing the same thing. So, um, you know, that's what we're all here to do is to educate. Um, so moving on, these are just, uh, you know, some, uh, we made these a few weeks ago. They're available on our Facebook and our, in our album. Um, they're just, again, you know, we talk about doing the right thing, staying six feet apart, wearing a mask, um, you know, and, and just continuing to be Shenango County strong. Um, so, you know, please continue to do what you need to, to, you know, to comply. Um, we're all in this together. I know, you know, we all say that, but we really need it. Um, you know, our, our office works really closely with the county. We're working really closely with our businesses. We're just trying to help everybody and provide information. So, um, you know, when you, when you come out of this and you go back to your business, your employer, um, you know, yes, does wearing a mask all the time stink? Yeah. But do you have to do it? Yeah, you do. So just do it. <laughs> um, I think we're just all trying to get through this in the safest way possible. We want to do the best thing we can so that our whole county can continue to move forward. And as I said in the very beginning, you know, it's a congratulations to Shenango County in the Southern Tier. You know, the reason we're able to move to phase three is because we've all done the work. Our numbers have been kept low. We've done what we've needed to, um, to stay the course and stay strong. So we just need to keep doing that. And, you know, one day we will look back and this will hopefully be, you know, a bad memory, <laughs> so, <laughs> but a good memory because we all came together and did this together as a team and made us a stronger, stronger Southern Tier. Uh, so we have Matt Beckwith um, is on with us, and he's going to talk to you just for a few minutes about PPE and the hand sanitizer distribution we've been doing. So we went ahead and did two uh, drive-through distribution points here at the Public Safety Building. Uh, one was actually the 2nd of June, and then the second one was actually the 9th of June from 10 in the morning until about one o'clock. So through those two distributions, we did roughly 135 distributions between the two. We had 85 the first day and uh, 60 something the second day. So uh, during those distributions, we were handing out uh, cloth masks, um, one for each employee that was coming through um, for business. And then we handed out a box of surgical mass. We would hand out a case of the two ounce hand sanitizers. And then depending on the size of the business, uh, we, we would hand out at least one, if not two, or sometimes up to four gallons of, of gallon containers of hand sanitizer. So as of the 11th of June, uh, I gave Carrie some information. We have given out uh, over 1100 gallons of hand sanitizer. Uh, 61,000 surgical masks, um, over 30,000 cloth masks, 8,000 over 8,000 face shields, almost 9,000 N95 masks, uh, and over 4,547 isolation gowns. And we have some other miscellaneous items like gloves and other things that we had handed out as well. So in total, since uh, the inception of uh, COVID-19, we have distributed to around uh, 413 different agencies and businesses and, and things that have gone through our uh, distributions, nursing homes, and et cetera. So at this point, uh, we do have hand sanitizer that is left. Um, and we do ask that uh, if you are interested in receiving any hand sanitizer, my number is on the screen. Feel free to call my office. If I do not answer or happen to be on the phone, please just leave a message and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Um, in some instances, we're going to try to, if we get a lot of them, we'll try to distribute those personally to the businesses. Um, but it may end up being somebody have to come up here to the public safety building and pick it up. And we'll make arrangements for you guys to be able to get that. Uh, the masks uh, right now are in limited su supply. Uh, as a matter of fact, to make it through the last distribution, um, I bought uh, about 4,200 
masks, um, and we have none left. And uh, we do have some of the cloth masks that are left, and we can hand those out as well. But right now, for the surgical masks, uh, we do not have any more available, and they will not be shipped. Uh, from what we're hearing, we are not going to get any more from the state. So, but they are readily available. We do have some distributors locally that do have the surgical masks that are willing to get rid of them, uh, sell them actually. And uh, I've talked with her about the pricing. Um, there is a lot of price gouging going on and uh, the amount that she's selling the masks for are certainly more than reasonable. So um, they are readily available in the event that you do have to get some. And unfortunately, like I said, I, I've given out over 61,000 and I don't really have any of them left. So, um, but we do have hand sanitizer and that is still readily available. My plan is to have that available for everybody and uh, we'll get them out as, as, uh, as people need them. So if anybody has any questions, they can call my office. Uh, it's listed there, 607-337-1862. I'm usually here by about seven o'clock in the morning. I leave, eh, it could be seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever at night, whenever we get done. So, um, you know, if some businesses can't get here until after five, uh, we're certainly available to go ahead and hand out after five o'clock if we have to. Thank you so much, Matt, to you and, and to your whole team for doing these uh, distribution days. I know it takes a lot of manpower to do it, a lot of people coming through. Um, and I know you've done uh, special pickups for people um, throughout the last couple of weeks. So thank you very much to, to everybody at your facility. Um, we did have a couple of questions. Uh, are, do you have any more face shields? Um, I have some face shields. I don't have a lot. I think I have in my inventory 20 something. So if there are salons that need them, I do have some of them. Uh, they were made by DC Mobosis and donated. So I do, you know, it's, it's gonna be first come first serve. And, you know, if you, and they're really good quality. I mean, Bosis did a really great job making these. So they last quite well. Um, so yeah, if somebody does need some, they can, they can call me and we'll, we'll make arrangements to get them some, yep. Thank you. And we have, uh, we have about 30 or 40 left as well. They're not, as thick as the ones that Matt has. Um, they were ones that were also donated that um, A. Jones brought to us. Um, so they're, they're a little bit of a flimsier shield, but if you're looking for that extra protection and Matt doesn't have any, we have some here at the office, just give us a call and we'll arrange for that. Um, somebody is asking about um, gloves too. Are you still distributing gloves, Matt? We have a very, very small supply of gloves. So um, I think I have larges and extra larges that are left and, and I know there are some people, obviously, uh, females will wear medium. I, I don't have any of those left, but I do have some larges and extra larges that are left. So again, yeah, just, just call me and um, I don't have a big supply of them, but I could, you know, we could give them a box of 100 or if they need them. Yep. Thanks. Um, a question was asked about a face shield in place of a mask. I mean, Isaiah, I don't know if you know differently, but my understanding is it's, it's never supposed to be one or the other. If you have to wear a face shield, it's a mask and a face shield because of the, right? That is correct. That's what we are advising folks. The face shield, while it may protect you, doesn't protect those around you um, because you're, you know, those droplets can still get out. So, and if you, face shield's good if you can also maintain social distance. Uh, we talked about that on our Tuesday call a little bit, uh, but in general, we'd want to see the mask and then also a face shield for another level of protection. There was a question earlier too about some different agriculture, um, equestrian. There's a lot of guidance on the forwardny.gov page regarding those and then also the um, New York um, Ag and Markets page regarding both of those things. Um, so if any of you have any questions, I think give us a call offline and we can help, help you find that specific guidance um, as it relates to those, those items. Um, so we are still taking questions. I, you know, I will say, uh, Omar and Faith, do you have anything else that you would like to say? No, I think we're, you know, just, we're available, whatever anybody needs, and we're willing to, um, you know, help people through this. We have some pretty good connections with the SBA, just like you do, and we've tried to connect people with the right resources, um, you know, when we need to, but Thank you all for everything that you do. Thanks for hanging in there, and and um, you know, hopefully we can we can get through this last phase together. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. And Omar, Omar Sanders is our representative from um, ESC. Yeah, um, no, yeah, I just, I just wanted just to offer, you know, um, you know, my office is here to help and support um, if there are any other questions about some of these, this, this phased approach. Um, I know I've got a lot of questions about, you know, uh, businesses that are, that were part of phase two, but now with phase three and bringing on additional uh, businesses that may be intertwined, you know, um, how does that impact their ability to do the affirmation? So we're, ha we're happy to take on any of those technical questions, you know, in collaboration with you, Kerry. Um, so just, you know, anyone can feel free to reach out to our office uh, um, for any assistance. Yep, Omar and his team are, are really on top of it. So, you know, we work collaboratively together. That's how we, that's how we get through this. Everybody has to collaborate. And it's, it's been really amazing to see that. Um, we, it's close to five. So I want to get through the last couple of slides. And if we have time, we still will take questions. And if we don't get to your questions, um, we will get in touch with you afterwards. I have a, a list of all of the questions that were being asked today. Um, so real quick, just a plug for Commerce Shenango, what we've been up to. Um, we are in the middle of a rebrand. We're also getting ready to launch, hopefully soon, a brand new website. With that is going to come a new member directory and some added features. We're also taking a look at our quarter three and quarter four programming to decide what programs we were going to do for 2020, what can we still do, how can we reimagine them. Um, again, it's an exciting time to see sort of what that innovation looks like, and the staff here has been really busy uh, working on that. So we're excited to share that. Um, for many of you on the call, you know, we've been doing these uh, webinars for the last few months. We've been making them free and open to anybody. Um, so here's a plug. If you have not yet joined Commerce Shenango, you know, what we do takes time and resources and the investment from our community is what helps keep us going. Um, so we're offering a special, you know, we're halfway through the year. So anybody who has not been a chamber member before and you're a brand new member, it's a six month uh, membership at 50% the annual dues. Normally when a uh, new business joins, they pay for a full year up front and then the following year is prorated. Um, but because recognizing what's been going on with COVID, we realize resources might not be as strong as, as they were. Um, so please contact Mary if you want to get more involved with Commerce Shenango and with our programming. And just an update on Healing the Front Line, this initiative we started a couple months ago. We are very close to our $10,000 goal. Uh, we've raised $9,430 to date. Uh, we've given 469 meals, and we've used a total of 27 local restaurants throughout Shenango County. Um, we do have a GoFundMe page set up. You can send in donations here. Um, there's a, a little picture of, of some of the donations that we've done throughout the county. This has been such a wonderful uh, experience for us. The, we have such a generous giving community. I know we've talked about that earlier. I know Nina's has been doing um, some of this as well. And the generosity of our community members has been overwhelming. So thank you to everybody who's donated. Um, thank you to all of the service organizations that we've liaisoned with. Um, it's, it's just been a wonderful thing for Commerce Shenango to be a part of. And here is just some contact information again. So the uh, Shane County Health Department, Emergency Services, and our office. Um, so if there, we have just a couple minutes. If there's any last questions we can try to get to, um, let me just look. I don't see anything new. So please contact one of our offices. As we said, we'll, we're going to download this video. We're going to share it through our YouTube page and through social media. Uh, please feel free to share it with anyone who has any questions. And we will do this again for what is hopefully phase four and hopefully toward the end of, of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you so much. And thank you to our presenters uh, for being here with us today. Special thank you to Anna Banks and David Scholl for, for taking time to be a part of our presentation.